John, written in 1929, but it's the most recorded gospel song in the history of recording the music. So, um, but it's a wonderful song because it talks about the fact that someday we're going to fly away. God has a special place, uh, time for everyone, and uh, everyone's time is different, but unless we make it to the time when the Lord Jesus takes the church up, then there, all of us as believers will go at the same time. That would be awesome. But either way, looking forward to that. Some glad morning, and this life is over, I'll away to a land on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Well, this morning I brought with me uh, a bag here, and I've got a couple pieces of rope that I brought with me. 
And what I'm going to do with these, so I'm going to show you, actually, I'm going to show you that the bag is empty. So I'm going to put these two pieces of rope in this bag, and I'm going to take them out, and they're going to be tied in the center. Tied in the center. <laughs> Box of tied. For those younger people who don't do their own laundry, this is a laundry detergent. <laughs> so it helps you get things clean. It's supposed to be the number one brand now. And, uh, but just so you know, I did tie the ropes together. And uh, I'll show you that the bag is empty so I don't have the pieces because they're tied together. So I talk about this because I want you to know that sometimes we get all tied up with life and the craziness of life and the busyness of life and stress out over it. And I just read this week, um, let me see, Psalms 34, verse 8. It says, do not fret, it only brings evil. Isn't that something? It only brings evil. That's what God says about fretting. So we should not fret anymore. The other thing about that is that it cleans, tied cleans things. And so what we need is we need the Word of God, which is the original GPS, is what I want to talk about this morning, to help us to be clean and to learn to trust God and to not fret. So I have provided some notes there in the back. If you're a note taker, you can see those notes uh, in the back by the bulletin on the little table as you come in. I want to, um, we're going to be turning to Psalm 119. And starting at verse 90, 97, I will put that on the screen too. But I want to talk about the idea of a GPS first of all. Everybody has these days a GPS. If you have a smartphone, you've got a GPS. Whether or not you've used it, you have one. It's a global positioning system. And, um, oh yeah, so the scripture, okay, I didn't put the verses first. Let me also read the scripture first then, since I have it here. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all night, all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. In the last verse, I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. Let's pray. Father, we know that your word does not return empty without accomplishing what you desire. So, Father, we ask you to speak to us today through your word, through your Holy Spirit, through my mouth, and through the thoughts that we have, that we might be focused on what you have for us today as an act of worship. I personally believe that the word of God is the most important part of worship in any worship service. Not the singing, but the word of God. But the worship with words and singing is good. The worship with offering, giving back to you, even... Just, you just require a tenth, but that's a chance to give back, that, that and an offering. Um, that's something else we can give. And we can also give praise and encouragement, even exhortation at times to brothers and sisters through fellowship. So thank you, Lord, for these opportunities to give to you. And we pray right now that we open our minds and our hearts, that we might give those to you so that we can learn from your word. And then... Be also open. This is an open Bible church, so we're going to open the Bible and have open hearts and open minds to obey you. That's very important. We learn to obey. <clears throat> James uh, chapter 1 says that those who uh, hear the word only deceive themselves. But those who do what it says will be blessed. So help us, Father, to be faithful to do what you teach us today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have the <coughs> scriptures here, and uh, yeah, so there's the typical GPS you're used to, but there's also, okay, well this is an explanation, I forgot to put this on here. 
This is showing a farmer's tractor, and farmers are using GPS too now. They can actually set the GPS, and, and they just automatically follow on the right rows. It's pretty incredible what they can do. But it's showing how it's going to, they call it triangulation, because they're going to three different satellites. That's how they figure out where you are and can trace where you're going. Uh, actually, in this case, I guess they've got four satellites pictured here. And what I wanted to, to mention is that if you were operating an airplane, very different from a car, because you're up in the air. So what you need to see is what's ahead of you, not what's... You don't have to have a map view. A map view can be helpful to know where you're going, but <coughs> what you need most of all for safety is to see ahead of you. So you can see ahead this way, in this screen, and this screen, you can see the planes flying forward, and you can avoid mountains and towers and things like that, skyscrapers, uh, flocks of birds, whatever, they, whatever can show up ahead of them. It's incredibly valuable and useful. So we all, we know about many of those types of GPS, but there's something you may not know about. On this slide, you see these two receivers on this bulldozer, and they have them for road graders as well. Used to be, I grew up in a construction company, so I would go along with my brother who's a civil engineer. We would set the stakes in the ground, and I would hold the stick, and he would tell me how, how you know, keep going up or, or to keep going down, and he'd say, stop right there, and I'd take the Sharpie and mark underneath the stick, and that would be the precise point. He would say, put C3, that would mean cut three feet. And so we, we, I would put the C3 on there, and the bulldozer operator to come along would see he's got to cut three feet below that line. And then we'd have to offset stakes as well. But nowadays, with the GPS, you don't even have to do that anymore. Engineers can double check what the GPS is doing, just in case there's a glitch in the computer or the programming or something like that. Uh, it might be certain days when the satellites are not working properly, but for the most part, you always have the signal. And now, uh, not only can the operator sit in the seat and look at a screen and just go with the screen, it can also be fully automated with a robot bulldozer and robot, and the operator does not even have to be in the machine. So that's the uh, advancement of GPS. But we've been given a GPS that's been around for millennia, and that's the Word of God, which is a godly positioning system. So each of us has an opportunity to read the scriptures anytime we want, anytime, and we can have God's guidance for our lives incredibly valuable tool for us as believers. But you know, most believers don't read the Bible on a regular basis. Most believers don't read the Bible every day. And we need it desperately because the Bible is God's Word, or in other words, it's God's words. God speaks through the Word of God uh, when we read it. If we don't like it, then it's something He wants us to fix. <clears throat> but other times, uh, God's just saying, you know, go ahead and do what you need to do. So it, it's godly in two ways. If you're taking notes, the next blank, the first blank was godly positioning system. The second blank is it provides God's guidelines or rules of the road, just like we have rules for safety out on the highways. They're there for our safety and other people's safety. If you're going too fast and someone pulls up in front of you, you won't be able to stop in time. So that's why there are certain speed limits set so that you have enough time, hopefully, or at least most of the time, to stop. And uh, you were talking about Thanksgiving. Well, I could have killed, a, I don't know, three or four turkeys today and brought them to church with me. <laughs> Down by Milbridge, there was a whole bunch of them on the road, but anyway. Um, so there, God provides guidelines, and He provided rules for us, like the Ten Commandments and many other rules, because He loves us. That's why parents have rules, because they love their children, they love their grandchildren. And they want the guidelines to help them be safe and to become better people. Secondly, God provides an example. So we have God's example. Ephesians 5.1 says to be imitators of God. So we're commanded to imitate God if we're a true believer. Now I want to say this about belief. I may have said it last week, but this is something that God has revealed to me uh, based on what I've studied about Scripture. There are people who believe that Jesus exists, believe the Bible is true, right? But they don't do anything with it. Satan believes it's not going to go to heaven. It's not going to be in the new Jerusalem, the new earth. Nothing, right? Because belief is not enough. Some people say all you need to do is believe. No, no, no. Because there's at least three ways to believe. You can believe about something. You can believe in something. And then you can believe it. So, for example, with Jesus, it would be you believe about him or do you believe in him? 
That's where most people are, either in one of those places. But a disciple of Jesus believes him. Whatever he says, whatever God says, whatever the Bible says, we believe it, and that's how we're going to live. So you have those three different levels, the believing about something, which most Americans do. 80% of Americans believe God, they believe Jesus, but they don't believe in him. They've not given their lives to him. They've not confessed sin to him. They don't see that they have any sin. So they're still in that first category. <coughs> so those who see their sin, they admit their sin, they believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of the sin, and then they call out to him and confess their, that he is Lord. Those are the people who are in Christ and are saved. They believe in Christ. Then you have those who simply believe him. Whatever he says, they believe is true and correct. So we have God's example. And then... Uh, I guess I didn't put those on the screen. I'm sorry. I preached this several times without using this PowerPoint because sometimes we don't have the option to use it. So God's guidelines and God's example. And uh, Psalm 119 tells us the Bible's God's global positioning system. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible, and Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's in the center of the Bible, not exactly. Psalm 118 is in the exact center. If you count 1189, that's in, the, that's in the middle. And then Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 118 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And we're all in the center of the Bible. But Psalm 119 talks entirely about the Bible. That's fascinating to me. This, this is an amazing book. And the Bible is four, has 40 different authors written over a 1,500-year period. And yet it all flows as if there's one author. And that's because there is. It's a supernatural book. If God is the author. And by the way, just in case you're curious about things like this, the Bible has archaeology to support it. Archaeologists say, whatever the Bible talks about in, in the Middle East, there's no controversy. Whatever, anything the Bible said, there's no contradictions. What the Bible has said and what they found is archaeologists are the same. You can't do that with the Book of Mormon, the Magomed Vita, the Quran. You can't do any of that. You can't use archaeology for those books doesn't work, because they're mainly <coughs> ideas and thoughts. Although the Book of Mormon has, has said that the Israelites came over hundreds of years ago and made with Native Americans. So some professors from Brigham Young University got together and said, we're going to prove that that's true. So they got DNA uh, testing equipment, and they found that it was zero. It wasn't true. So they left the Mormon church. They left Brigham Young University. And some of them are evangelical Christians today, and I'm not sure about the rest of them, but they left because they, what they believed in was not true. But with the Bible, every time we try to confirm what it says, we find that it's true. And so historians also, throughout the centuries, have said, yeah, the Bible's true. There was a Paul. There was a Peter. Jesus rose from the dead. James and John, they're all real people. None of this is made up. But in the other religious books of the world, you can't prove anything in them. So you have to go with a total blind faith. We don't have to live by blind faith. We can live by an accurate, scientific, academic, historical faith. It's incredible because the Bible is true. So I could talk about that for hours because I love to, to show how the Bible is relevant and it is true and it's accurate. But this particular part, we're in Hebrew a poetry here. And in the... Old Testament, there's 39 books. And there's a couple interesting numbers to keep in mind. You have 5 and 12. You have five books of major history, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They also have the law, so it's also called the Torah or the Pentateuch. Five books, pen for five, right? Two for writings of books. So you have those names for it, Pentateuch, Torah, but you also have five books of major history. Then the next 12 books are minor history. So there's 5 and 12. Then the next five books are books of poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Solomon. Then the next five books are major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Then the next 12 books are minor prophets, just because there's less information about them. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and so forth. So we have five books of history, major history, 12 minor, history, five poetry, five major prophet books, and twelve minor prophet books, and we're done. The Old Testament, there it is. You come to the New Testament, you have five books of history again. Fascinating. 
you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are biographies of Jesus, of Jesus and the book about the church, the book of Acts, or the Holy Spirit, or the Acts of the Apostles, or whatever you want to say that. So five history books. Then, it gets a little bit different, we have 13 by Paul that we're pretty sure are his, and one more Hebrews we don't know, some say Paul wrote it. So that throws our number up, but at least for the Old Testament, we have 5, 12, 5, and 5, 12. New Testament, you have 5, then you have to have 13. But the interesting thing about the New Testament is all of those first books, after the, those first five, everything else, the next 13 in a row are Paul's books. That's how they're categorized. Then all the other books after that, well, Hebrews we don't know, but the other books are by Peter. If it says 1 Peter, it's by Peter. If it says John, it's by John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Um, if it's by Jude, it's by Jude. You know, if, if the name is Jude, if the name is James, it's by James. So all the rest of them are by the name of the author, except for Revelation, which is by John. So that's the whole 66 books of an overview. But coming back to these five books, they're books of poetry. So the book of Psalms is a book of poetry. And in fact, in this, we have 22 sections with eight verses each. And they're following the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, those are the Hebrew letters. There's 22 of them. And by the way, um, Aleph, Beit, and then in, in Greek, it's Alpha, Beta. In ours, it's A and B. So we get alphabet from the Greek language, alpha beta, alphabet. But you can also almost hear it in the Hebrew, aleph bet. And so that's where we get the word alphabet in English. Uh, so 22 sections, eight verses each. That's a form of poetry, just having that pattern that exists there. Psalm 91 has um, two sections of eight verses each, which are mirroring each other. So we, these are just types of Hebrew poetry. And so there's eight specific words that are really important here for us to understand. That they sound like they all mean the same, but they don't mean the same. The word law is the idea of direction instruction. So when you have laws for driving out on the road, those are for direction and for instruction. And you are, when you're in your car, you're, you're going somewhere. So that's direction. And then you have the word testimony, which in this case is not to give a testimony about how you came to Christ, but in this case it's an admonition. So you give an admonition, or it could be an ordinance or statute, but normally it's the idea of an admonition. You're admonishing someone in some way that God has taught you. Sometimes we have that in testimony services. Someone will get up and say, well, I'm not going to tell you how I came to Christ, but God spoke to me this week and this is what I think he said, and I want to share that with you, maybe it'll be encouragement to you. That's an admonition. Then you have the precept. <coughs> A precept is a command that's intended to be acted on, ongoing. So, the Bible says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're supposed to do that every single day. That should be something we think about every day, is uh, loving the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Ten Commandments would fit in number five, but let's talk about statutes first. The statutes are a prescription. So, God has given us prescriptions just like a doctor would. And it's for our good. We want to get better. We want to have peace and joy and fulfillment in life. Follow God's prescriptions in the Bible. So we have that, those words, statutes. That's the word statutes we usually see translate into English. Then we have the word commandments. It's just simply an order given. It's like a military commanding, saying, getting down, you know, get down and give me 50. 50 push-ups. You know, that's a command. It's a one-time command. The precept is the ongoing command. So that wouldn't be a precept, that would be a command. It's not a statute, not a prescription, it's a command. You have to do what you're told at that moment. Then you have the word judgment, which has to do with justice. So again, it's providing direction and information in the area of being a law or a command or precept, but it's specifically related to justice. So that's what a judge does. He says, this is what's going to happen to you now, and this is what's going to happen moving forward. Kind of like a prescription from a doctor, but it's related to justice rather than just you getting better. So it's a little bit different slant on the use of the word. Then we have the word word, which is the normal one, as in speech or written word. Then we have the word promise. It's more like, as I give you my word, I promise that I'm going to do something. So by the way, in the Bible, we have lots of promises and principles. If you train up a child in the way you should go, you will not depart from it. That's not a promise. It's not a guarantee. That's a principle. That's where you do your best at that, and, and there's a very, very high chance that that's going to happen. Uh, according to Focus on the Family, over 70% of young people who are brought up in, in, with loving parents who teach them the Word of God and they go to church faithfully, over 70% of them will come back to faith 
That's what the numbers are showing right now. Um, we'll definitely come back. It doesn't matter how wild they might be in their teens and 20s. By the time they get in the late 20s, usually, early 30s, they come back to faith. They go back to church again and they're very serious about their faith again. They seek forgiveness of their sin and all that sort of thing. So there's a principle that's certainly there. It's certainly working for most people. But children are, have their own choices to make. So don't feel guilty if you have a child, a grandchild, who's wayward, doing something, drugs, or whatever it might be. Don't worry about it. Just pray about it. Don't fret, remember? Fret only brings evil, according to Psalm 37, 8. So don't fret. Just pray and trust God. Cast your burdens on him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares, right? So casting, when you're fishing, casting is doing this. It's not doing this, bringing it back. That's reeling it in. It only says cast. It doesn't say cast and reel. We're not talking about fishing. We're talking about throwing. The, the word cast in our culture, we think when we're fishing, but actually it's the word throw. You throw it away. That's the idea. So you throw your burdens away. Trust God. Trust Him with it. Don't fret over it. It will only bring evil. Trust God. So we have these various words which help us understand in the Old Testament, all of these words are going to be constantly showing up. So now you'll know, when you see some of these words, that they're different from some of the other words. Sometimes it's a prescription that God has given us. Something we can do, which is going to help make things better. And sometimes it's a law that we need to obey for direction. Sometimes it's a judgment that has to do with justice, and so forth. So there are four things that everyone wants to get from a GPS. I'm sorry, I just put that, I forgot to put that on the screen. I'm not very good at keeping this up, sorry. So there's, there's uh, four things you want from a GPS. You want to know that it works. So Psalm 1998 says, the word of God works. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes, and more understanding than the elders. So the teacher one came true in my life. I became a Christian when I was 10 years old, but when I was 14, God called me into full-time ministry, uh, I believe, and that's when I started playing guitar, and I didn't take lessons at first, and I'd had some lessons over the years to help, but basically something that God gave me, and I'm just so thankful for that, for that gift, but continue to use it. Um, but uh, when I was 14, I also had a chance in class to prove that I was going to walk with the Lord and serve Him. And in a science class, the professor said we came from monkeys. And of course, now evolutionists don't use that term very much. It's been ridiculed so much over the years. They rather talk about amoeba or whatever, or just the evolutionary forms that happen. Uh, they say happen, allegedly. And uh, anyway. Um, some fascinating things about that that have not made the major news, but um, that go against evolution completely. And evolution is dying. More and more scientists are becoming uh, believers in some sort of divine uh, aspect. Of course, unfortunately, many believe it might be alien origin, uh, but our, of course, the Word of God says it's God, our Heavenly Father, who's our Creator, and Jesus Christ Himself is a Creator. Um, but when I was in this class, I said, teacher, that's wrong. That's wrong. The Bible says that God created Adam fully mature and functional. And by the way, that answers the questions about the stars and all that, because stars are supposed to be millions of years old. Well, they look like that, because God made them that way when he created them. Just like man, man and Adam and Eve were created mature. They weren't babies. They were mature. Adam was working the garden. So God created the whole universe, I believe, for sure. So which came first, chicken or the egg? The chicken. <laughs> Simple answer. So I said to him, that's wrong. He said, we went back and forth. Well, in the, in, I, I didn't fail the class, which was great. But I saw him four or five years later. And he was a born-again believer. Amen. So God had done a great work in his life. And he started with a little bit of truth from a bold... Uh, preteen who didn't mind saying, you're wrong, the Bible's right. That boldness, God uses boldness. There is a major producer in Hollywood who was practicing uh, a homosexual lifestyle 
And he heard that at a little uh, bistro, he was sitting down having coffee and something, and there was a Bible students sitting there talking about the Bible, having a Bible study right there. And he overheard them, so he said, what does the Bible say about being gay? They said, well, we're going to be honest with you. The Bible says that God doesn't like it. And God says it's sin. He said, thank you for being honest with me. And he left. Well, then after he heard that truth from Scripture, it burned inside of him. So he went to a church, and God directed him to a good church where he heard the gospel. And within two or three weeks, he accepted Christ, and he's left that lifestyle completely. He has no desire for that. His, his love is God himself. And so truth initiates things. So we have more insight. It doesn't matter what culture keeps telling us about evolution and about LGBT plus and all the other things of our culture, transgenderism, whatever it is might be. The Bible is still correct. It's still right. It always will be. And we need to speak truth in love. So those students were speaking to him in love. And I didn't know about that when I was 14 years old when I was speaking to a teacher, but I knew I couldn't be too disrespectful. But we need to do that in love. So we have more insight because of the Bible, more understanding than the elders. And so today, a lot of young people don't think, you know, because they can answer questions with this immediately, you know, just Google it or ask Siri or whatever, um, they can get answers right away. They don't think that elders are that smart sometimes because we, we struggle sometimes with some of the stuff that's on here because we live longer. Well, those who are, say, 55 and up have lived longer without a cell phone than they have with the cell phone especially a computer and the internet and stuff like that, uh, because they haven't been around that long. Younger people think they've been around forever. But what older people have is life experience, so they have knowledge and life experience. Younger people don't have life experience. So how valuable would it be if they could listen to elders? But they tend not to want to, and our culture has always said that. Even when I was very, very young, the culture said, don't listen to your parents, don't listen to your grandparents, older people. So, but the Bible says to do that, but we can have even more understanding than they have if we're in the scriptures and we're obedient to the scriptures. Secondly, not only want to know how it works, but you want to know that you're going to get to where you need to go. So the Bible says that the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So what I've shown you here is a couple examples of lamps that were made when this was written. They would take a round bowl about this big, and then they would push it in and push it in and keep shaping it to get that shape. Then they put a little piece of wick in there and olive oil in there. And it would be the size of, you know, about this tall. And that lamp could fit in your hand. And that's what they had. So when the Bible says, the word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's the picture that was painted uh, about 3,000 years ago. So we have a light for my path, right, and for my, so my protection, my direction, basically, the lamp for my feet, see, I can go down safely, up and down the stairs without falling down, so a lamp for my feet, protection, and a light for my path, direction. I can't see the door, if this was pitch dark, and there was no exit light, and that sort of thing, I only have this lamp, I can't see the door yet, but as I keep going, a few steps at a time, I'll find my way out. So God has not promised us a super bright, you know, 1200 lumen flashlight that shines way down and you can catch the eyes of a deer 100 feet away or whatever. He hasn't promised that. He's given us a lamp. He wants us to live day by day. That's what he wants. So for direction and protection, he's given us that. So that God's word is a GPS for life for us. And thirdly, you want to, know, you want to have a safe trip. So I've kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that will bring safety. Did you know that one third of Americans have sexually transmitted diseases? One third. So if you take away all those who are too young and all too old and uh, those who are you know, faithful to their spouses and practically everybody else who's in fornication or LGBT plus community or whatever has something going on. And that's something you're not hearing in our media. You're not hearing that several hospitals are overrun in certain wings with AIDS patients and you know, other things of that nature. And then, of course, abuse. People who have been beaten up you know, by a spouse or a parent or sometimes a child. The abuse comes from any direction these days. 
But the sin in the world has brought so much suffering on people, it's totally unnecessary. And there's even simple things like addictions to little things. Sugar, for example. I, I read that 80% of diabetes is type 2, and 80% of type 2 diabetes is brought on our, by our own diet. We bring it on to ourselves because we have too much sugar in our diet. So there are so many things. Now, the Word of God doesn't say anything about sugar specifically, but it does have a lot of dietary restriction in the Old Testament. Here, here's a couple examples of that. Pork and shellfish. I know, lobster, fishermen, sorry, but... Um, <laughs> But it, the CDC actually says today, if you go to their website, it says only them occasionally. And other studies have shown that's the highest risk of food poisoning in your restaurants. Because you have to prepare them a certain way for them to be safe. In the old days, they didn't know how to prepare them properly. Now we know, so it's much safer today. So I'm not saying don't eat them. But I'm saying that God gave us some direction on that. In how to be healthier and how we eat. And Jewish people tend to be extremely healthy when it comes to diet because they have certain diet restrictions that they're following. Mm -hmm. So God's Word has given us so many amazing things to help us uh, along our journey. And He wants to keep us safe. So He's given us His Word for that purpose. And then you want to enjoy your trip. So uh, it says in verse 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The Word of God should be sweet. Now, sometimes you'll open the Bible and you'll start out, say, in Genesis, and you've got some good stories there. Noah and uh, the Tower, Tower of Babel and all kinds of things like that. Great stories. You get into Exodus and all of a sudden, okay, there's a story here uh, with Moses, but just a few chapters in, all of a sudden, you've got the law. And uh, you're reading through the law, and then Leviticus, Deuteronomy, it's like, oh, man, this is, I can't, this is crazy. you got to... You can't do this, you can't do that. And so what I recommend is people start with the J books. If you haven't read your Bible for a while, go to the J books in the New Testament. New Testament is the last third of your Bible, if you have a full Bible. And look for the Gospel of John. It talks about Jesus the Son of God. Deity of Jesus. And also has at least a couple chapters about the Holy Spirit. Great, great theology. Uh, the seven signs of proving that Jesus is God's Son in the Gospel of John. That's where you find uh, Jesus saying, if, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And all kinds of great verses you'd want to memorize. Great stuff. But then you also have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It talks about fellowship and, and that sort of thing and growing in Christ. And then the book of James. Just five chapters, but it is packed with practical Christian living. So get into the Word of God. Don't start at the beginning of a full Bible, unless you just read Genesis. Because there's so much that is going to bog you down after Genesis. So I would highly recommend you go into the New Testament first and you do the J books. Then you can go back and have a, everyone should have a Bible reading plan. You should read, read the whole Bible every two to three years or every one year. It's not that hard. But what happens is, for me sometimes, I found that if I'm just reading um, a few verses a day, there might not be anything that's there for me. But if I keep reading, I might find something and just knock my socks off. Wow, this is amazing. I didn't know this. And we did a Bible reading plan one time in one of the churches I was in. And we had we divided, divided the church into four teams. We had these big thermometers we put up, too. And every week we'd come in and people would report how much they read in the New Testament. And uh, what people were saying as a result of this competition for reading the New Testament was, I never knew the Bible said that. And God spoke to me this week. And it's just so exciting to read this because they had never forced themselves to do it. It's like exercise. If you force yourself to exercise at least three times a week with weights or with even, even just walking a couple of miles, if you start doing it on a regular basis, you will feel so much better. It makes such a difference. And science proves that. The endorphins get flowing. You feel better about life. Seriously, it, it really works. I love exercise. It's changed my life. I can still play basketball, and I'm old. I've got seven grandchildren. So it's by the grace of God, see, that we can apply some of these things uh, in our lives. I want to close with this story. There was a witch doctor, his name was Vicente. And uh, he was not your average witch doctor. He was one who didn't care about all the hocus pocus. What he cared about was actually helping people. So he had all his uh, homeopathic remedies and things like that, and he was really trying to help people uh, to get better. And 
he saw in his community there was increasing uh, wickedness, families being broken and drunkenness and those sorts of things. And he said, there's got to be something I can do to help the people in my community. So he decided he was going to look for a religious uh, option. So he went to the, a city nearby where he was, and he found this religious bookstore, and he bought this book and said, I think this will work. He brought it back to his village, and he started inviting people to his home to have these studies in this book. Well, it wasn't long uh, before a missionary found out about this witch doctor having these people come, and the people were getting better. The community was getting better. So he had to investigate it. He found out this holy book, actually had the word holy on it, was the Bible. <laughs> Vicente picked it up because it said holy. But it was actually the holy Bible, and these people were coming to Christ, and that's why their lives were being changed. So God wants to change our lives, not just the initial, you know, getting into becoming a believer, but also as the disciples, those who just believe it and live it. And it's, it's awesome. I've lived according, or tried my best, I should say, according to God's word, and it, it gives me fulfillment. It gives me joy. It's so, it's so awesome. It's so good. Thank you, Father, so much for how much you love us. You've given us great gifts, the gift of salvation, which is available anytime to anyone. You've given us the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, to counsel us, to comfort us, even at times to control us when we need it. But you've also given us this third amazing gift, is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, according to Ephesians 6.17, is the Word of God. You've given it to us, and we have it at home. We probably have several copies at home. And it's alive, but we forget it. And we put it off. Why do we put it off? Because we have a sinful human nature. And a sinful human nature and Satan and the world, three enemies of the unholy trinity, are all fighting against us reading your word. Why? Because your word talks about the things that we need at the core of our lives. So help us, Father, to pay attention to your word every single day. To study it, not just read it, but to study it to meditate on it, to memorize it, and then to apply it. We pray all of this, Father, that you would challenge us in this way and that these thoughts would burn in our hearts, in our minds, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and turn to hymn number 120, 119. 119. <laughs> Thank you. 
came together in this church and gave me worship and freedom here in the United States of America. We do, we do pray for global leaders in the country. We pray for a revival all over the world and the nation. And we pray for safe, safe trip home to Terry. And we might have a good time this afternoon.